Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra Zakieva. I am a doctoral candidate in the University of Heidelberg. I work in Center for Organismal Studies where I am supervised by Thomas Grepp. Today I will explain to you how we can get a full organism from a single cell. Afterwards I will talk about my PhD project, Cell Wall as a Regulator of Plant Morphogenesis. Morphogenesis uh, means the generation of forms. In biology it is the study of how plants develop and uh, generate different forms. Now uh, let's start with the first part. First of all we need to get clear on what kind of cells we are talking about. All living beings can be subdivided in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are usually represented by bacteria. Uh, eukaryotes are represented by a huge diversity of animals, plants and fungi. Prokaryotes are unicellular, while eukaryotes can be unicellular or multicellular. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes can be distinguished between each other by looking at their subcellular structure and organelles. There are some common features, like plasma membrane, which uh, separates the outside of the cell from its inside, the cytoplasm, DNA containing uh, the necessary genetic information, and uh, ribosomes responsible for um, messenger RNA translation into proteins. There are some significant differences as well. Prokaryotes are surrounded by a cell wall. Eukaryotes have a nuclear envelope which uh, separates the cytoplasm from the nucleoplasm, uh, which forms a nucleus. And in the nucleus there is also a nucleolus where tra translational RNAs are synthesized. Another subcellular structure of eukaryotes is rough endoplasmic reticulum. It is physically connected to the nuclear envelope and is covered with ribosomes. Membrane and secreted proteins are synthesized in this compartment. These proteins are then transported through Golgi and vesicles. There is also smooth endoplasmic reticulum responsible for lipid uh, biosynthesis. Mitochondria is the energy power plant of the cell. Peroxisome is a waste management center where toxic molecules are uh, detoxified. In order to move all this stuff around and to stay in shape, eukaryotes have cytoskeleton. In this presentation we will focus on eukaryotes. We can subdivide eukaryotes on different kingdoms like animals and plants and the same way as before, we can distinguish them by looking at their subcellular structure. Animal cells have lysosomes, which are the centers for bulky waste like broken organelles and membranes. They also have uh, microvilli, which are plasma membrane protrusions, allowing animal cells increase their surface without increasing too much of their volume. Chloroplasts are the main signature of plants. This is where light becomes life. Chloroplasts use CO2 and light energy in order to produce sugars. Vacuole is another uh, specificity of a plant cell. It maintains uh, the turgor pressure in the cell and uh, provides a place for toxic molecules uh, produced by some plants. Every single plant cell is covered with a cell wall. Don't mix it up with a prokaryotic cell wall. Plant cell wall has a different composition and glues plant cells together. Contrary to animal cells, plant cells prefer to stay connected through special pores called plasmodesmata. Now let's finally look how single cells can compose a fully functional organism. But first let's zoom out and look at the structure of an organism. As I work on plants, I will show you an example of a structure of a plant. Plants present a huge uh, biodiversity, but here I will talk only about flowering plants. At young stage, when the plant has just germinated, an aerial part and a root are formed, uh, which grow in the opposite directions. They are connected by a special organ called hypocotyl. This is kind of an embryonic stem. At adult stage, more and more organs develop like leaves, shoots and forms. 
This is Arabidopsis thaliana, an organism model to study plant development. This is a life cycle uh, showing how it grows from a seed to a fully grown plant, which can flower and produce its own baby seeds. So it starts with a seed containing the plant embryo and all the necessary nutrients in order to make the seed germinate. Once it, germ it germinates, cells divide in order to produce uh, new tissues like in the root tip and in the shoot tip. Once the plant uh, grows older, new types of uh, cells start to divide, uh, leading to thickening of plant organs like uh, hypocotyl, for example. Then reproductive organs are generated, like uh, this ovule. Once uh, the flower is pollinated, uh, <coughs> seeds are produced and the life cycle starts. So how do we get from a small seed to a fully grown plant? How can we get from a single cell to a complex tissues and organs? You might probably guess that we need cell division for this. But before I explain to you how cell division works, we need to get clear on how cells manage to preserve their genetic background after so many divisions. For this, we are going to look at chromosomes organization. Chromosomes are organized in pairs. Biologists don't invent any complicated names for them. They just put numbers on them, like chromosome pair number one, number two, etc. The number of uh, chromosome pairs depends on every species. Every single chromosome is composed of two identical sister chromatids. Every pair of chromosomes is composed of a maternal homolog and a paternal homolog. This means that uh, the maternal homolog comes from uh, the mother of this uh, organism and the paternal homolog comes from the father of this organism. When we talk about maternal and paternal homolog, we are talking, of course, only in the case when the organism can sexually reproduce. When every chromosome has its pair, we are talking about a diploid cell, or we can also annotate it as 2N. When the chromosomes don't have their homolog pairs, they are called haploid cells, and we can annotate them as N. This information is crucial in order to understand how two types of cell division work, mitosis and meiosis. During mitosis, uh, the homolog uh, chromosome pairs align in the middle of the mother cell. Then the sister chromatids separate and are enveloped by a newly formed plasma membrane of two daughter cells. In the end, the two daughter cells are diploid. They contain the same genetic background as the mother cell. Mitosis is responsible for cell proliferation and therefore tissue generation and organ growth. Meiosis is a bit more complicated. It starts again with the mother cell where the homolog uh, chromosome pairs align in the middle. Then two homolog chromosomes separate in two uh, different cells. This is meiosis 1. Afterwards we have meiosis 2 where sister chromatids separate in uh, uh, two daughter cells. In the end we have four haploid daughter cells, two of them containing the paternal uh, genetic background and the other one containing the maternal one. Meiosis is important for gametes production and therefore sexual reproduction. Later, maternal and paternal gametes will fuse together in order to produce a zygote, a new diploid cell. Now, if you look closer at mitosis, you can see that the daughter cells have exactly the same genetic background as the mother cell, except for one thing. They have only one sister chromatid for every chromosome. So how do daughter cells uh, become mother cells again in order to continue cell proliferation? Mitosis is actually only part of the cell cycle. This is when uh, division happens. Then cells enter a G1 fa phase when cells grow and afterwards they enter S phase where the DNA is replicated and every chromatid gets its sister. Then uh, the cells enter the G2 phase 
where cells grow even more and then become mother cells in order to enter the mitosis again and produce new daughter cells. At some point, um, cells, uh, some cells get their function because, they, for example, they want to produce a hormone or become a vascular cell. So in this case, uh, during G1 phase, cells get out of the cycle and differentiate. So they enter the phase G0. So these are three uh, main cell uh, development phases, uh, division, growth and differentiation. Uh, let's look closer on mitosis again. Mitosis can be subdivided in six different stages. Prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase and cytokinesis. During prophase, uh, DNA condenses, centrosomes are moved to the cell poles and the cytoskeleton radiates out of the centrosomes, forming uh, therefore a mitotic spindle. During prometaphase, nuclear envelope breaks down. At metaphase, chromosomes align at the cell equator and attach to the mitotic spindle. At anaphase, the sister chromatids migrate to the opposite poles of the cell. Then comes telophase, where a new nuclear envelope is composed around every uh, set of chromosomes, where the DNA decondenses. Finally comes cytokinesis, where a contractile ring is formed from uh, the cytoskeleton, which uh, separates uh, two uh, plasma membranes of the daughter cells. Now that we discussed how uh, plant cells divide and grow, let's go into details of my PhD project where I investigate the cell wall as a regulator of plant morphogenesis. What is amazing about plants is that they can grow endlessly. So how do they manage to grow that extensively and stay organized? Let's have a look how can we study plant morphogenesis. We can look at different levels, for example at single cell level, where the expression of different genes, the cytoskeleton and the cell wall, define cell morphogenesis. Tissue morphogenesis is defined by the coordination of the cell cycle of cells composing this tissue division, growth, differentiation. Organ morphogenesis depends on the tissue activity composing it. Whole plant morphogenesis depends on the development of its organs. You can see that there is one component that connects all these levels between themselves. It's the cell wall. It defines the shape of the cell. It glues uh, cells together in the tissue as well in the organ and it glues the organs together in the whole plant. It also provides a skeleton for the whole plant. In my project I focus on single cell and tissue morphogenesis. I chose Arabidopsis thaliana as my organism model and Hapocotyl as my organ model. Hapocotyl is located just at the intersection between the shoot and the root and uh, when I uh, do transfer sections of the Hapocotyl and stain them with a cell wall specific dye, I can see something like this at the microscope. You can see how extensive is the radial growth uh, just in a few weeks. At adult stage Hapocotyl undergoes exclusively radial growth which makes it a perfect organ model for morphogenesis study in two dimensions. The radial growth is important not just for the plant, but for the whole planet. Radial growth, plant growth is responsible for wood formation and world biomass production. Radial growth is due to the activity of stem cells uh, called cambium. 
Cambium is a cylindric tissue located at the halfway towards the center of hypocotyl. These stem cells stay in the cell cycle. They grow and divide. Cambium produces a xylem or wood towards inside of hypocotyl and phloem or bust towards outside of hypocotyl. These tissues uh, grow and then uh, differentiate. Xylem, cambium and phloem are vascular tissues of the plant. Xylem transports water from the root to the aerial part of the plant and phloem transports sugars from the aerial part to the root. These stem cells generate uh, new tissues which contribute to the tissue morphogenesis in hypocotyl. There is also a tight cell wall uh, regulation in uh, these different tissues. Depending on the cell cycle and the level of differentiation, uh, the cell wall can be more or less stiff. Now the question that I address in my PhD project is, is there a feedback regulation uh, loop from uh, the cell wall properties towards the stem cell activity? And do cell wall properties also regulate directly uh, tissue morphogenesis in hypocotyl. In order to answer these questions, I use a genetic tool. The main components of a gene are a promoter and a coding sequence. The promoter defines in which cell uh, the, this gene will be expressed, while the coding sequence carries the information. It calls for a protein which will acquire a certain fu function in uh, the cell, and in my case I'm interested in uh, two functions, cell wall loosening and cell wall stiffening. I want to modify cell wall mechanical properties by ectopically expressing uh, genes coding for cell wall modifying proteins. Ectopically means not natural. I want to use cell wall loosening proteins or cell wall stiffening proteins. And I want to express them in xylem, cambium or phloem. This way, I want to probably um, make um, softer cells stiffer or make stiffer cells softer. And if I could see that there are changes in the cell or tissue morphogenesis, this would mean that the mechanical properties of the cell wall are important for tissue morphogenesis in this context. I'm currently doing a lot of experiments and hopefully you will see my results in future publications. Let's summarize what we have learned today. We talked about plant development and we've seen a full life cycle of a plant. We talked about uh, cell and tissue morphogenesis and also the structure of the cell. We learned how mitosis happens and that it is part of a cell cycle. I told you about my PhD project where I investigate how a cell wall properties influence um, cell and tissue morphogenesis and I gave you an example how we can use a genetic approach to investigate how cell wall mechanical properties influence cell and tissue morphogenesis in the context of vascular tissues development. In conclusion I would like to stress again on the fact how important is uh, radial growth for the whole planet. I have just given you only a glimpse of academic and uh, applied research on cambium, but there is much more. And cambium activity enhancement is important for agricultural and industrial improvements. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and that it ignited your motivation to study plants. I wish you a nice day. This was Alexandra Zakiva. Bye-bye.